Uh, welcome back to Soul Back. This is the R&B Podcast. Kyle here back with Tom and Ed. Guys, it's been, let's just say it as, as simple as possible. It's been a minute. since we did <laughs> Quite a few days. minutes. Yeah. What's going on, guys? Was it was the last time when I was in um, New York? Was that the last <laughs> one? No, I think we had one in like November, I want to say. Okay. Yeah. And then like we promised everyone we would be back like weekly and that just didn't happen <laughs> then six months later we're back yeah we get emails i know tom you do as well from people that randomly hit us up and ask when's the next soul back podcast episode and i'll be honest uh life gets busy as you guys know i didn't really understand that until marriage happened and you're talking about full-time jobs tom i know you have a kid now so it's like i don't even know how we managed to gather the saw three together at one time it's it's impossible welcome to our world player we know it very well on the note of uh people asking for us to come back i got to give a shout out to jason clark he reached out um discovered soul back you know listen to every episode and now he's going to be uh working with me and kyle and you know i got soul and oh, that's uh, doing up. some stuff with us but uh good dude and uh but discovered the podcast and uh you know, there's some, he, he was in like New Zealand and he's like, this was one of the only things I could, you know, listen to that had to do with R&B. So it's like, hmm. man, we don't even know people were listening to this thing. Right. So I guess we're back by popular demand. And today, the the topic at hand, guys, we did the 90s. We did the 2000s. We looked back at those eras year by year. Ed decided, I don't know why he decided to do this because... It's just going to lead to disaster, but we're going to go through the 2010s as well. And we start off with the year 2010. Yes. And players, as we will get to today, living in 2010 and living in hindsight in 2023, I wasn't happy with 2010, but man, I wish we had some 2010 and 2023 <laughs> at this point. We'll get to it. It yes. was not all bad. But before we start with that, Tom, do you know what chat GPT is? Oh, God. <laughs> I do. I, I do know what it is. I have not tried it, but I do know what it is. So it's this new AI thing that everyone is using. You can ask it questions. You can tell it to do things, and it'll spit it right back out to you. So I decided, uh, because this is the Soulback Podcast and we talk about r and mm -hmm. I asked for the best R&B albums that came out in 2010. But we're going to wait for later because we're doing our rankings later. Mm, but interesting. Uh, I'm going to... I asked it this as well. The top five fast food chains. This is from... I don't know where they extract this data from. <laughs> but I think it's important that we uh, we talk about what they, they like and we go with... Uh, and we see how it compares to our top five. I guess most of the time chat GPT just pulls information from, I guess, things that people have created online. So if there are a bunch of lists of top five fast food places, maybe it correlates that. I don't know. Maybe the, these robots eat Wendy's. I don't know, but we shall see. <laughs> so chat GPT says number five is Taco Bell. I know Tom is already gagging. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's been it's been a while since I had Taco Bell, but had some good times at Taco Bell. <laughs> yes. Uh, number four is Burger King. I don't despise Burger King. Their fries are garbage, but the burgers are OK. Yeah, I got to be honest, when I'm out and about and I need to grab something quick from fast food, I'm getting that impossible Whopper. It's like a guilty pleasure of mine. Well, it's not go. bad. It's not bad. Uh, number three is KFC. Hmm. I haven't had it in a long time, but my beef with KFC is you bite into the chicken and one bite, all the skin comes off. <laughs> <laughs> my beef with KFC was it was impossibly greasy. It was just oh, disgustingly. That too. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> horribly greasy. If you're eating fast food and deep fried at that, it's going to be greasy. But, player, I don't want my chicken to be sitting in a pool of its own <laughs> grease. <laughs> All right, uh, number two is Subway. Remember when people thought Subway mm. was healthy? That was fun. We, oh, yes. what a time! What a time! <laughs> oh, just look at how they make the bread and what it starts out looking like. That's all I have to say. Ugh. I don't think I actually know what they do, but uh, I'm gonna YouTube that later. Don't 
Well, you've been warned. I'll say that. I, I know what Tom is talking about. And number one would be McDonald's, which I heavily disagree with. But like Ed said, it extracts data from who knows where. And McDonald's is number one. Well, yeah, that's just like saying that Drake is the best rapper. Just because it's the most well known does not mean it's the best. It's not at all the best. Have you had it as an adult? It tastes great when we were kids on field trips with our five dollars. But as an adult, it's like a sandwich made of construction paper. Mm. No. All right. Listen, I'll have to say this. You cannot go wrong with McDonald's fries. No. They okay. are they especially after Drake. Especially after drinking. I mean, it's like the best thing ever. So, yeah, I have to say, just because of the fries, McDonald's is up there for me. I'll give you that. All right. Shout out to McDonald's and shout out to the Jap- uh, chat GPT. We'll be, uh, we'll be back to using that shortly. But let's get into 2010, guys. I'm curious what your overall thoughts were for 2010. And I guess even to put more context to that, where were you guys in your lives in 2010? What was going on? Uh, both personally and also as a music lover. So, Ed, I'll start with you. Yeah, start. So, well, I'll be happy to kick it off. So, 2010, I know we talked about this in 2009, but it was like, what, five years ago we talked about that on this podcast. So, I'll catch folks up. I moved from Kentucky to Birmingham in 2009. So, 2010 was my first full year in the city that I've been living in ever since. So, it was a time of transition, so I was not listening to music as much as I would be in the, probably the following years, but I was catching up on stuff, and I was getting settled in my career, so Soul & Stereo was in its infancy. It was around. I was doing reviews, stuff like that. Hadn't hooked up with you guys yet. That'll be in a couple years coming, but I was still, of course, tuned into music, and while I was not, I thought it was a little better than 2009. I thought R&B was getting very, very, very shaky going back and listening to like some of the stuff and preparing for this podcast. Like there was some actually some decent stuff. So maybe I was a little hard on 2010. For me, I had just started, you know, I got soul a couple months before at the end of 2009. So I was brand new in the game. Blogging was, you know, blowing up at the time. Kyle wasn't even a party. You know, I got soul yet. I dragged him in a year later, probably. We were doing some stuff with statics, uh, you know, tribute site and all that. But what I remember about 2010, especially around that time, it wasn't like it is now. Nothing on social media was like overexposed. Like it was yeah. kind of still hard to get access to artists. You know, it, well, believe it or not, you could get access to artists more easily, like MySpace and stuff. If you knew how to access them, it wasn't like sending a DM. You yeah. kind of had to hunt them down a bit. But like it was like it was nothing like there was no streaming yet. so. That's kind of why I even created the platform, because a lot of these artists who weren't on the radio anymore needed something. And for me, that's when my kind of passion really ignited, because it was kind of fun, you know, being at the forefront of that. But uh, yeah. yeah, looking back, I have fond memories of 2010 and R&B. Yeah, it's interesting, because when I think back to 2010, I was in university at the time, and just a couple years prior to that, I was all on the the Brian Michael Cox production, the underdogs, Stargate, all of that. And then 2009, 2010, when those albums started coming out, you started seeing less and less of those producers. And I was so obsessed with that sound at the time that I was trying my best to find it any means necessary. So if it wasn't albums that actually came out, it was records that were leaked online. So I was totally obsessed with it to the point where I found myself listening more to songs that had leaked on the internet than <laughs> songs that were actually released. So my my perspective on 2010 is kind of weird. Like I just went on my um, playlist earlier and I typed in 2010 to see what I had on there. It's a lot of unreleased stuff, but like Ed said, I actually looked at the albums that came out and listened to it, listened to some of it because a lot of it, if I listen to it now, I appreciate more than back in the day. And another thing, and Tom, you'll know this is back in the day, I had a huge stigma against independent releases. <laughs> I was really? All about, yes. I oh, was all yes. about the major album releases. So I remember back in those days when Tom was like, hey, Donnell Jones put out a new album. I would look, I'm like, is it released independently or major? <laughs> Tom would be like independently. I'm like, nope, not listening to it. Yeah. That is, I did not know this. This is a news to you, boy. But 
and I'll explain why is independent was a brand new thing in R&B during that time period. Mm -hmm. And artists, unfortunately, hadn't figured out how to transition without losing the quality that the major labels provided. So if you listen to that Faith Evans album that we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. or the Donnell Jones album that we'll talk about later that came out in 2010, that stuff sounded rough. It wasn't mastered. It was mixed weird. It sounded like it was recorded out of their bathrooms. So to me, I was such <laughs> a sucker for good yeah. sound quality that I just couldn't listen to that stuff. But when I listen to it now, um, I can appreciate it because it still had the good melodies, had the strong lyrics, but sound quality and all that, that mattered a lot to me back in 2010. Understandably so. And that's something that we take for granted today because of the Internet era and just the way things are. And to be fair, artists have figured out a way to present more polished products. But you're right. Back then. We'll get to Faith and a few others later, but it was disappointing to hear the quality of music that we were used to hearing from just a few years before. And then you would hear this and it just didn't sound right. And it just wasn't written right. It just ah, it drove me nuts. I had kind of forgotten about that. That's a good point. Yeah. Can I can I drop a high level observation on you guys about this this year or especially yeah. this era? There was some great music released, but none of it. And I'm going through all my top 25 year ahead of the year songs, the top albums. These songs did not have any lasting impact or staying power. I never hear any of these songs played anywhere this day. Mm -hmm. I barely hear any of these mentioned, which is a shame because, like I said, there were some good songs. I almost feel like this this era and this kind of year and this time period of R&B is just kind of almost lost somewhere in, in out in space. I don't know how else to put it. Well, this is a transition period. There are some songs that have lasted thanks to TikTok. Shout out to Miguel and Sure Thing, because yep. apparently that's like a thing again now. But yeah, all of these songs that we're going to talk about for the next couple years, 2011 too. It's like we were in that weird period where we were transitioning. So these new artists were trying to come on, unfortunately, just vanished into the ether. The veterans were trying to come back, didn't quite work out. And then kind of in the middle of the year, we kind of got new faces that stuck. So I understand why that was happening. Yeah. And another observation I'll put is like Tom and I have put it have been like putting up songs of the day on our Instagram page. Just yeah. To like have people relive those memories we don't really touch on the 2010s even though that you could say that was a decade ago it's like do people really know these songs aside from the diehards and i don't know it's it's crazy it's gonna be a tough decade as we will get into this podcast <laughs> yes. series but this is our job it is to educate enlighten and bring awareness to this music so um let's set the stage here 2010 my observations are i think hip-hop started to really bleed into r&b significantly and this was kind of also the beginnings of that edm dance oh pop, god oh. Which we'll talk about later with the neos and the ushers of the world oh. ed paint the picture for us what was happening in 2010 why 2010 again i have always said that every decade we see a shift in tone we see a shift in sounds and we had auto tune doing its thing in the early in the late um, 2000s that would definitely carry over into here. But we just also had this heavy electronic sound where we had a lot of artists who were trying to find themselves. And that meant a lot of established R&B artists who in the late 2000s, things were a little shaky, like this, the stuff that they were doing wasn't quite working anymore. So they're like, OK, let me hop on this new wave. So we've got our R&B soulful stalwarts. They in the club. DJ got yep. us falling in love. Oh, man, and, and, and that <laughs> oh, same man. beat on everything. Ugh. But that was the sound, and everyone was following that. Unfortunately, it may have been short-term success, and uh, it may have hurt some people in the long term. But, oh, we got so oversaturated. I will yep. never want to hear those beats again. <laughs> I, I remember being so disgusted. You, you know this. Every... Yeah popular artists who had radio hits prior suddenly they were not on the radio they were trying to copy that sound 99.9 .9 of the time it never sounded good no i mean they might have tried to convince themselves it was good and it never worked either some of them like you know usher and neo bled into that lane and they made it work but like the rest it, it just didn't do anything right for them and it just sounded bad 
Yeah, because I think it's easy for us to think about the ones that it did work for, but we we tend to forget the ones that it didn't work for. Yes, and I can't I, I can't even think of the names anymore. But there were a lot of them. Well, there's a reason why you can't think of the name because I'm sure someone will come in the comments and be like, "Oh, well, Usher," because you know how it is, man. Oh, this time it's been a long time since I've had one of my rants. So I'm about to go on one of my rants. Oh man, <laughs> yes, <laughs> y'all love on Twitter. Oh, I forgot to say it. The following content of this view is from <laughs> ET Bowser, not stolenserial.com. <laughs> not you know I got so so come at me. Anyway, play us. Every time you make an argument, I don't need y'all to go to Wikipedia to tell me what went number one, what went platinum. I know I was watching it when you were two. I know what went platinum. I know who's blew up. That does not mean the song was good, and it does not mean it has a long-lasting legacy. It's a lot of number ones that were gone in like three months. The stats mean nothing to me. Mm -hmm. Ed, how is it possible to get so upset while wearing a flower shirt? Because the flowers are a distraction. It hides the hate <laughs> underneath. Mm. <laughs> I love it. Um, but aside from that, it's, you know, the, the, the genre had changed. Obviously, the sound had changed. But, Tom, the other thing I meant, uh, I'll mention, and this is part of why you started, you know, I got so a lot of the veterans that came from the 90s, as they're going through this transition, they're no longer on major labels and they're putting it out independently. It's not making a dent on the charts. I'm curious how they felt at that time because they probably didn't know what the heck was going on. Yeah, I'm trying to think back to like interviews we did at that time. It was almost like a free for all, like the rug got pulled out from under some of these artists. A lot of these artists, they were trying to do their best to adapt. All they really knew how to do was make music a lot of them. So yeah. they were just making songs, throwing them out there. No one was even finding them because it wasn't like they could just put it up on Twitter or Instagram really yet. That wasn't even really around in 2000. I mean, it was around. It, Twitter was around, but it wasn't blowing up. Mm -mm, Instagram, not yet. not yet. Oh, Twitter in um, 2010 was fun, Tom. You could actually reply to it, send a message to an artist and they would actually reply. To I, I yeah. do remember because they didn't even have that many followers yet. I mean, they yep. were still building their following. So it was totally different. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, they, they were putting these. I, I'm trying to remember how they were even putting songs out. Because like there was no streaming, so like how were they even releasing stuff? I'm trying there to remember. There was, if I recall, and you would know more than me, just from my end on Soul and Stereo, a lot of what they were doing, it was a lot of YouTube. Like they were still coming out. Yeah. Videos yeah. weren't being played. Like there yeah. was no one on six, but there was still a lot of videos. I used to keep a notebook, and I would just have like all the videos of artists, and I would go back and watch them. So they, YouTube was still a big platform back then. So they had yeah. that. And they were starting to ease into the blog era, but there were a lot of artists who were very resistant to that at the time. They would learn yeah. to, in a couple of years, to step over that. But they were just, everybody was finding their way. Yeah. And I that's why I appreciate y'all for what you were doing, for giving artists a platform. I started Soul and Stereo just because I saw there, there were all these artists that I love and their music was out. But nobody was writing about them. So I was like, yeah. well, let me write about these artists that I love. So nobody else going to do it. I'm like right. Thanos with the glove. Like, I'll <laughs> do it myself. So it's the same thing. I think the other thing they were doing at that time, they would like go on Twitter and post a link to the iTunes. Yep. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Looking back at it now, it's like good luck on getting people to buy that album. <laughs> That's it's, well, it's you... like in hindsight now. Yeah. Knowing what we know now with streaming and all that. It's impossible to ask somebody to pay nine ninety nine for an album. The well, only dumb is like me who want to fill up this thing. <laughs> they'll do that. right. I remember they would be sending us MP3s feature my song. We'd have to literally figure out how to embed the remember the MP3 player yeah. in our blog pile. I mean, yeah. those oh, were the days. I remember that. Yes, I hated yeah. that thing. Yes, because yeah. that my, wasn't easy. Forget it. Centered, like it would always be weird. Yeah. Yes, and these things weren't easy to to figure out. You know we. It wasn't like now. You just yeah, get you a, a Spotify in there. You upload a song onto your your server. The visitors yeah. keep playing the song, and then it shuts down your website because you've gone for the bandwidth. <laughs> that was that was good times. Oh man, yeah. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's talk about uh, 2010. Uh, we've kind of talked about how it caught us by surprise as we look back at it. Some decent albums that came out. Uh, we'll get into the albums, but let's talk. Let's first off talk about the rookies that came out in 2010. And I think we're probably missing a couple. So this is a very limited amount, but this might be just what it was because I'm going to also say this. There were a lot of artists that debuted in this era 
but there were a lot of artists that actually didn't put out an album because mm -hmm. they were one and done. They put out a single, it doesn't work, and they're 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 gone. So That's these true. are the ones that actually did put out an album. Janelle Monet, Miguel, and Dondria. And that's it. I feel like there has to be more than that. I, I got another name. It okay. was an EP, I think. But uh, remember Avery Storm? Yeah, I do remember Avery, Avery Storm. Storm. Yes. Yes. I don't even know if he ever released an album, though. No, I don't think so. And uh, I got to mention Marsha Ambrosia. She put out her mixtape. It wasn't, this was when mixtapes were still a thing, not yet EPs. So yeah. Her her solo album would come, I think, the following year. So Ed, what is an EP in twenty twenty three? Isn't that just an album? Player, well, yeah, at this point, we just had this argument in the solo <laughs> stereo cipher. I got a shout out to Cipher on Facebook. Go check us out there if you like what you hear here. Shout out to my <laughs> Cipher homies. But yeah, we're like, what's the difference between an EP, a mixtape, and a, a a playlist and an album these days? Because now it's just in name only. Because there were back in, and I think that Billboard and um and the Academy still uses the rules. The rules of like length as far as time, and that determines whatever. But now it's just like, eh, I want this to be a mixtape. It's longer than an album, but we'll call it a mixtape. I want this to be an EP, but Janelle Monae just released an album that's the size of an EP. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> here so I don't get fined. So, Ed, Janelle Monae just released a new album, but back in 2010, she was an Android. Talk about this album, because I know this is high on your list. This is very, very, very high on my list. Um, at some point, I think at 2010, I ranked all of, well, I, I think I did the top 50 R&B albums of the decade, and I know this was top five. But this was before she was, you know, free in the nipples. She was doing concept albums, and she had this concept of she's an android, and she's using, but it's really just a metaphor to talk about women's empowerment and liberation and things mm -hmm. like that. It's very, very smartly done. And the woman can sing smartly crafted songs, incredibly written songs. I just love, y'all know me, I'm an album person and I love albums that tell great stories. This album told a great story. And I was like, this woman is going to be one of the ones to carry us through the decade. I don't know, but mm -hmm. not really. But this album is one of the best of the decade for sure for me. But it's interesting. I look back at Janelle Monet in that era, and it was like she was almost like had a cult following. It wasn't like she was a star yet. No. I mean, I, I didn't even really, I heard about like her music through someone else. It wasn't like it was really big yet. And then to me, it was like so strange, like Metropolis, the song, great song sonically, but I'm like, what, what is going on in this song? You know, <laughs> I don't even know. But, and it worked though. So, I mean, it's great, great music, amazing artist. Yes, and everything was so high concept. To her point, I mean, maybe to her detriment, it was a little too high concept. But for those who became super fans, they became super fans. Mm -hmm. And she decided to go to Hollywood and now she's just swimming around with the breasts out. And Twitter <laughs> loves it. So I'll talk about that new album later on. We'll get to that later. Yeah. Uh, another album that came out, rookie debut album, was Miguel's debut. Tom, this album, because I feel like this is a good example of how different R&B was starting to become. Our, uh, Miguel was coming more with an eclectic sound, and that, that also had a cult following. You had people that really dug Miguel, but then you had traditional R&B fans that were like, what is this? This is not R&B. Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, it didn't make a huge impact at first, that, yeah. that album. I live in, I'd have to look at the charts because I don't recall a fan, but it, like you said, cult following You know, was something fresh. It was different. I, I always hesitate to call him R&B because he blends so many genres, but it yeah. was definitely something fresh and new. I was all into it at the time, but to Powell's point, it was very, very different. And we, as we go into the decade, we'll see the rise of alt R&B and, you know, Weekend and Frank Ocean, and we can argue back and forth about what they are and what they aren't. But I thought that Miguel, even though a lot of his stuff was kind of leaning left, there was enough that was kind of rooted, especially in kind of like late era neo soul that I was like, this is interesting. I was, it was an album that I, I didn't get when it first ca came out. I don't even know if I reviewed it, but I picked up on it later in the year. I'm like, oh, this joint is kind of dope. And I became a fan. So good album. 
Now, with the success of Sure Thing, thanks to TikTok and whatnot, so I'm going to give you guys some numbers here. In 2010, when it was released, 2011, uh, this song peaked at number 36 on the Hot 100. It was re-released this year, uh, and now it's peaked at number 13. So it's bigger than it's ever been. It's actually a bigger record charts-wise than Adorn. Is it now safe to say that Sure thing is Miguel's signature record. I would say no because I don't count TikTok in a way that other people do. But I mean, you could make that argument. It's all about perspective. There's a definite audience that only knows him from the weirdo sped up version of Sure Thing. So in their mm-hmm. eyes, that's his biggest hit. To us, it ain't bigger than a door. But who am I but the old man in the flower shirt? <laughs> right. <laughs> As they say, Ed, you just had to be there. You so had to be there, player. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Adorn was on Urban AC charts for like six years before it. Good lord! Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, the last album that I want to talk about. This is a rookie. Is Dondria's album. Uh, this is an interesting one, Tom, because to me, this was like the beginnings of YouTube sensations. Dondria got her start doing covers on YouTube. Got discovered by Jermaine Dupri. You got to see the whole makings of the album on webisodes, I think they were called at the time. And you got it, you got to witness it on YouTube, the creative process. It's kind of crazy looking back at it now and how that's become the norm. But at that time, that was definitely different. Yeah. I mean, artists not having to go through the major label system, you know, being able to create their own impact, build their own fan base. It was kind of a new concept in the late 2000s. But uh, I always think back to the interview we did with Jermaine Dupri, where he's, we asked him, what is one artist you thought would have been bigger that you that you helped put out? And he mentioned Dondria because he said he had her prepackaged. She had a fan base. He brought her to the label and the label literally had no idea what to do with it. And it, mm-hmm. the, it just dropped the ball. So, like, I always think of that because, you know, history could have been totally different if the label would have got it. Well, yeah, she's in that list of artists from that decade. We'll get to Melanie Fiona and a few others in the late um, 2000s that I just feel like were right there. And in a different era, they would have just like taken off. And she's one. And like she's great. She can sing. Her songs are well written. Everything is there. And it's just everyone constantly fumbles the ball with her. So I can understand her frustration because I'm frustrated. Mm hmm. Tom, you know what I remember? In 2010, oh, no. when you interviewed Dondria, I told yes. him, tell Tom, I mean, tell Dondria, Tom, that uh, when I have my wedding one day, you're the one that's Dondria's hit single will be on my wedding playlist. So I just got married last year. Was you're the one on the wedding playlist? No, I don't think it was. Oh, <laughs> it oh my God, cut. Kyle. It did not make the cut, unfortunately. I just... This- yeah, I don't. I don't but, is that song even on on Spotify? <laughs> I don't know that it is. I haven't heard it in forever, ever. Yeah. In Kyle's defense, when I told her that, and I remember this to this day, when I said that to her, she had like a baffled response, and it was very awkward. So maybe that's why Kyle decided to remove it. <laughs> Did she like not remember the song? Is she like Lil Wayne who doesn't no, remember this any was, of the songs? This was back when the song. This was, was twenty. This, this was, was right was at that happening. time. Oh, this is when the came song out. came out? Yeah. Yes. I had already deemed it a wedding classic, and she laughed at me. <laughs> so. Yeah, it was it was awkward. Oh, man. What are you going to do? We got to pull up that clip. Uh, oh, but yes, the song, the song is on Spotify, so if you guys want to listen to it, it is on there. But oh, uh, the album was a solid release. Um, unfortunately, just due to timing, just how the industry was at the time, that song, that album just kind of like slipped under the radar, but... One that is, I mean, Jermaine Dupri produced it, so you know it's going to be quality, but I would recommend everyone to just go back and listen to it. It's very traditional R&B, great singing, so check that one out. Um, Let's get into some albums that came out during this era. I'm just going to start listing them, the female albums, and you guys tell me what stands out here. All right. Chrisette Michelle dropped an album. Candy's Candy Coated album came out that year. Kiki Wyatt's Who Knew? Carrie Hilson's All the Boys. Keisha Cole, Calling All Hearts. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Marsha's debut, or her EP, Yours Sincerely. Tedra Moses, Royal Patience. That was a mixtape. Vivian Green, Beautiful. 
Erica Badu, New America Part 2, Monica's Still Standing, Jasmine Sullivan's Love Me Back, Sade's Soldier of Love, Tony Braxton's Pulse, and Sierra's Basic Instinct. What stands Ooh. out here? Well, um, let me try to remember a few of the ones that you said. Just some that kind of come to mind that I really like. I thought Badu's album was great. I was, I know that I'm going to get canceled on the internet, on Key Sweat's internet. I was not a big fan of New America Part 1. That's the one everyone loves. Mm -hmm. It was a little too spacey and, and weird for me. But I really liked Part 2 because it was back to her more traditional sound. I thought it was great. And we have not gotten a real album from her since. So it's been, what, 13 years? Crazy. But I really like that album. Um, what else did you say that I wanted to mention? Kiki's album. If I recall, that album was like pieced together from unreleased albums that yeah, never came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that one has some dope songs on it, I remember. But it was, you know, a little disjointed due to the nature of it. But I, I liked it a lot. Handy's album, I did not listen to at a time. I just listened to it mm. because I ranked the Escape um, discography, including the solo joints, back when they were having their reality show. And who lowered their reality show? That's another time. Mm. But um, that album was in. Eh, I don't remember liking that one all that much. Keisha Cole was solid, if I recall. Yeah. I think uh, that one was pretty uh, solid. I wanted to get into that Keisha album real quickly. That's like the album no one remembers. Yeah, no one talks about it, but yeah. I remember there was a Tank song that was really good. There were mm. a couple of sleepers on that joint. So yeah. That one's solid, and yes, those mixtapes you mentioned, both Marsha and Tidra, both fire. Both fire. I'll mention Faith Evans, too. Something about yes. Faith. I feel yeah. like that's one of her most underrated projects, underappreciated. Uh, the Tidra mixtape, I remember because she had put out her album in, I think, 2004, yeah. and then never put out anything else, and then all of a sudden like she started doing some mixtapes, but this, to me, was the one was like a great collection of songs. Mm -hmm. uh, Are You For Real was on there. So good. Uh, and and uh, the Keisha Cole album, and I, I don't know if you remember this, Kyle, but I did not like it at all. And mm. I was a Keisha Cole fan, and I just got to this one, and I was like, man, this, this is not working and didn't like it. I've and revisited that's... recently. It's, it's better than I thought at the time, but I, still not like what, to me, her first couple were. So that's no, where I... it's not I, to that level, but it's not that's bad. That's where I put and, I and guess, it, you know, go, go ahead, Kyle. <laughs> well, that's I was going to say, that's why we're blocked on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that's probably why. <laughs> I, recently, <laughs> I recently posted something about her Lifetime uh, bi biopic, and I tried to tag her, and I couldn't even tag her. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah we're blocked. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we didn't do it. We literally did not do anything. Literally. I play. Uh, I'm blocked by like five rappers that I have never even written about. I don't know. Yeah. I don't. Who knows? Who but knows? Tom, to, to our credit, we're still uh, alive and well on Instagram. She has not blocked us on there. So be on your best. Oh, behavior. yeah. There oh, we well, go. She, she hears this. You will be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, was that um, Carrie Hilson's last album? That was. Yes, that was Carrie Hilson's last album. She has How was that one? released an album since. It was cool. I think at the time I really liked it. Um, it's not something I really revisit as much these days, but at the time I really liked it. So I mushed all of her albums together, so I can't remember which one. Yeah, because they came out like them. really close to one another. So, what was the one with the um the Chris Brown the, song on it? That was was that this one or the one before? I think it was this one actually. Yeah, because I remember no. I can clearly see the album cover, but I just can't remember which song is which. Uh, let me see here. This is the one with Pretty Girl Rock on it. That's what I remember. But let me double check here. Ugh. I got to get my Wikipedia facts straight. Talk here. about a song that <sighs> ugh, I never want to hear again. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's that song, but good God. <laughs> the Chris Brown song is on this album. Okay. That was yeah. my joke. Is it interesting to look back at that Jasmine Sullivan album? It's like she right now she can do no wrong. She's humongous. But like no one even really, to me, talks about this album. It just yes. kind of went unnoticed. I, and I'm glad you brought that up. I mentioned I wanted to mention that when Kyle mentioned it. So I, again, go to soulandstereo.com. I just ranked her discography maybe a month or so ago. And I had forgotten about this album because I when I went back and read my album reviews of her earlier albums and every review, I'm like, 
will y'all please show Jasmine some love? This is a superstar. Why won't y'all pay attention to it? Now she mm. can do no wrong. Yep. But back then, nobody was checking for her. This album to me is probably the weakest, though. It's just, eh, it's not enough. There's nothing that really stands out. There may be one or two tracks, but nowhere near the level of the debut and the album in 2015 that we'll get to mm. later. So it was an okay album, but y'all show more Jasmine more love. Go listen to the old projects. Don't just listen to Hotels. <laughs> but I think Jasmine in 2010, Tom, she also had kind of like a cult following. It's like, she didn't have huge singles, but she had a fan base. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah That's true. Did. That's true. It was interesting. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about the males here. Or oh, we, we can't forget about Monica's album. I had just posted oh, everything yeah. of me on, uh, on, on our Instagram. And this was a comeback album for her. Yeah, I people. really yeah. like yeah. this one. This is coming off of Every Time the Beat Drop, which I can still see Ed dancing <laughs> to that song. No, you cannot. But uh, <laughs> a lot of people are starting to write her off like, oh, she's going into trendy music. Like, is she still relevant as an artist? And she came back with this one and she had some huge singles here and kind of stamped herself as like one of those must listens in R&B from top to bottom. So, yeah, and we're going to talk about this a lot in the next couple of podcasts, but there are. We remember the songs from this era, but we forget about the albums because this is around the time where the album experience started getting really shaky yeah. as we got more with streaming yeah. and, and everybody was more concerned with singles. But this was a strong album, probably her most underrated. So uh, let's talk about the fe- the males here because I can't forget about the males. Um, Donnell Jones lyrics. Drew Hill, Andrew Pendence Day, Dwelle, Once World Woman, Eric Benet, Lost in Time. There was the John Legend and Roots album. That was a cool one. Uh, Marcus Houston, Mattress Music, PJ Morton, Walk Alone, Raheem Devon, The Love and War Masterpiece. We have Trey Songs, Passion, Pain, and Pleasure, Usher's Raymond vs. Raymond, Neo's Libra Scale, CeeLo the Lady Killer, El DeBarge, Second Chance, Omarion's Illusion, Tank, Now or Never, and uh, the Jaheem's Another Round, The Dream, Love King, and the Prince of Darkness, the man we shall not <laughs> mention. <laughs> but he dropped an Urban AC banger love letter. Let's start off with that one because that was a big switch up for him and it worked. It worked really well for him. It worked. People don't remember. Well, some may remember. We were deep into the ridiculous. What was it? The, the soap opera stuff Trapped he in was the doing? Tra- Trapped yeah. in the closet, like version 87. We had the stupid TP3 Reloaded, the album where he's like in his pajamas standing on a <laughs> volcano <laughs> singing about sex in the zoo. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> so this album was super back to basics and it worked. And I won't say anything else. If I say anything else, positive or negative, y'all can come for me. So I'll just say the album worked. This was the, the, the um probably the only other album I ever liked from him after. Well, the one that came after this, I think, was pretty solid. But um, you remember the Happy People album? Mm, yeah, I remember. Like, like when, when he stays focused on like traditional r&b it's some of the best music we got in my opinion in that genre but it's like i don't understand you know he's just all over the place with his styles but this one was was really good and uh just goes to show you he was at the top of his game when he felt like it yeah when he's you know not being mentally ill he's all right so (laughs) (laughs) oh man uh, and then Dirty Money. I don't know why this is on here. That's not an R&B album, Tom. But I know you wanted to talk about this. Well, one, Dawn that was kind of, and uh, that's and, uh, true. K- Kalina or Kalina. singers. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but okay. it also featured a lot of R&B artists on it too. So I, I just figured. I mean, I figured it's worth talking about just because of because Diddy was following trends at the time. Yeah. So what what was the sound of this album that encapsulated that time? If you think about it, I don't. That... I I don't listen to it much, but. I that, know you like the cow. Yeah, that is like a Twitter classic. Um, <laughs> production wise, it was like out of this world. Um, it still to me sounds ahead of its time. 
I kind of wish the songs were a little better, but sonically, like that album was yeah. was next level. Kyle is right. So this album, I don't know if I've ever heard it in full. Now that I think about it, but. Wow. It was one of those albums that at the time people were raving about. And I listened to, I remember specifically listening to some of it. And I'm like, what is the big deal? And then in the recent years, people are just still talking about how great this album is. And I'm like, what did I miss? So I have to go back. I won't say one way or another about the album being good or bad. Because I, you know, I never say it until I hear it myself. And then I can trash it or celebrate it. But the stuff I heard, I did not love. But Twitter loves this album. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to throw out a couple of albums here for you, Tom, because I think these are ones you really liked. Um, El DeBarge, Second Chance. Oh, yeah. The guy, I mean, Ed, what was he going through before this time period? Everything. I mean, he had <laughs> addiction. He had court cases. My man was, oh, he was just going through it. And this was an opportunity for him to just bounce back from the headlines. And I was glad this album came out yeah. when it did. If this came out in like 2018 after Twitter had really gotten to the cesspool it can be today, mm. I don't think people even would have given it a chance because it's like, oh, nah, nah, he's on this and he been locked up and blah, 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 and cancel him. So this was before we got to the foolishness of Twitter and people were able to give him a second chance. And I love that he was able to one more time solidify himself. That song with Faith? Oh, oh yeah. Mm. Rock. Yeah. And he um, I just remember how touted of a comeback it was like it was a cool it was like an event. This comeback. I think he was he performed on some award show because people hadn't really seen him for a while. And then he made this comeback and it was great. The album, you know, was really good. So it was cool to see that comeback work out. And then, Tom, what about the Eric Benet Lost in Time? That was the oh, number yeah. one yeah. album on the You Know I Got So Year End Countdown. Uh, I'm wondering to see if Ed liked this one as much as me, but what I remember was like, he kind of tapped into some throwback sounds, but still kind of made it current and made it him. And I just, they, you know, that's why I called it Lost in Time because it kind of blended time periods. He had some awesome collaborations on there. Faith was on there. Let It See was on there. His daughter was on there. Mm. It was just, to me, it was so good. Such a good project. Um, I'm a big Eric Benet fan. I'm not going to say it's his best, but it's, a really good project. Yeah, this one was good. And honestly, I had forgotten about it until um I looked at the notes that Tom put together before the show. And I was like, man, that was this that year? Because the what the albums I think about them like later in the decade, and we'll get to those. But yeah, this one was a really underrated one. And I wouldn't put it as one of my favorites of the year, but it definitely is one of the better ones of the year. Disclaimer for anyone listening right now, uh all three of us had actually forgotten about everything that came out this year until two weeks ago. And we this started researching. True. Yeah, <laughs> it was rough. It was rough. Oh, man. And I just seen someone wrote, can't wait for 2012 and 2016. Oh, Yikes. well. <laughs> Leave actually, me off that 2012 one. No, 2012 I got. 2016. After 2015, it starts getting real rough. Yeah. 2012 I got, though. I'm definitely not on the Frank Ocean one. Which, which year is that? That's eleven or twelve. Yeah, that's, that's that's later on, Tom. If if the weekend gets brought up, I'm off that one too. So just <laughs> warning. Well, that'll be next week, so get ready. Uh, Tom, I want to get into this one, and I like talking about this album because you have to understand where Tom was at this time in his life. Tank had released "Sex, Love, and Pain," one of the greatest albums to come out in the 2000s. And then Tom is searching for leaked records from Tank. He's loving it all. And then now it never comes out. And in that, at that point, Tank can do no wrong. Tom's loving everything from Tank, even the Drake record that Tank has. Celebration, I think it's called, Tom? Yes, yes. Did this album live up to the hype of what you were anticipating? Oh, man. It was uneven, I'll say that. There's some good songs on it. Yeah. I think I wanted to like it more than I actually did. And shout out to Tank. You know, we... We love Tank, but it just was not sex, love, and pain. And uh, but there's still some good songs. I yeah. mean, Emergency was on here, right? Yeah, great song. Screams and, uh, on there too. That Rico Love song. Yes, I really like that one too. That was a great I'll song. have to revisit this one. It's been a while, but yeah. um, I remember going to the album release show and Tank was came out with his graduation gown on and hat. I don't wow. remember why. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, what was the why was he dressed like he was walking graduation? He was graduating from 
something to something else. He, I don't really know. I'll have to revisit the videotape. There was a reason. Tank's a great performer. I'll give yes. him that. Yeah. But absolutely. uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on that album. Mm. It was. You're right. It was. I. It was a cool album. Right, um, yeah. It was. I. Right. Yeah. Uh, I want to get into these uh couple of albums. I'll be honest with you guys, and I might get canceled for this. Uh um, oh. But I think I've made well, it. Pretty Kyle, much. before you do, let me just shout out Raheem's album. I just want to get yes, that one. Yes, an exactly. Accolade. That's a, that's a double it, album. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, that one was good. Yeah, double album because no one was really doing that at the time, yeah. and uh, really, really good. Raheem always puts out a solid project. This was his last one before he left the major label system, I think, and he was trying to get his money's worth. So I, I really like that project too. Yep. Um, I'm going to get into four of my least favorite albums of all time. <laughs> what? what? And three of what? them came out in 2010. Okay. Oh. Can't uh, wait to hear this. I know what one of them is, but go ahead. Oh, there's a couple here. Uh, so I don't want to say least favorite, but like most disappointing. Is that, is that a better mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, fa- that's fair. Okay. That's better. So number one is 112's Hot and Wet, but that's, that's well documented. <laughs> for a good reason even the, even the group i don't think like set up yeah so I think nor get, should they we get a pass <laughs> as a result of that um we have omarion's illusion album mm. very disappointed in that album i don't even remember anything i remember the title i don't remember a thing about that album I've never there's a song it. on there called i think my girl is by <laughs> yeah what we'll go back and listen to this album later <laughs> no comment on that because that means a lot different in 2023 somebody will get canceled <laughs> on the podcast uh the second album is marcus houston's mattress music oh yeah is this the album with swag sex on there tom i i think so yes, it is. yes, yes. i Sw- think so swag sex is on this album oh. i gotta review the track list hold on and then the last album is Drew Hill's Independence Day. That's the no, one man. I was waiting for you to talk about. I had no idea what was going on. on well, this first album. of all, can we shout out our boys from Drew Hill? We love yes, those guys. I love Drew but, Hill. But, but and, and, oh. and to my credit, I haven't heard that album since it came out. So maybe it's better than I imagined. But no, just from what not. I remember, I recently I did not listened like to it, it again. It's I what you remember. There's one song I like on it, and I'm blanking on what it is. It's like one really good song. But love rest, MD. Now, Love MD is okay. My yeah. my brother in law uh, loves Love MD. It was mm. not that one, but it's something um, else I really like. Yeah, I got. I have to get a check track list. Ed, uh, let's talk about the three big releases from the men. Uh, we have Trey Songs, Passion, Pain, and Pleasure, Usher mm-hmm. and Raymond versus Raymond, and Nia's Neo's Libra Scale. Mm. What stands out here? So. Before I get into it, that one Drew Hill song I was thinking about was called Away. That was a song I liked. Um, no idea. I need to revisit that then. <laughs> it's random album cut. It's good. Okay. But um, going back to the songs that you, the albums that you mentioned, so the three big ones, I guess I can start with Raymond versus Raymond. Sure. Eh, eh. Kyle, you, know, you remember how I felt when that album came out? Oh man, Tom, when he heard it, I was he furious. Was, yeah, I was. I was so. Mad. I wouldn't go that far, <laughs> no, but it was. Ed, what ahead, you gotta Kyle. understand is this though, right? Like every single that Usher was putting out, it was a different response from Tom. <laughs> so when, How so? When Daddy's Home came out, Tom was furious, and then There Goes My Baby came out, and Tom's like, "Okay, we're we're good." Yeah. And then Little Freak came out, and I think Tom's like indifferent towards that song, but indifferent. Nowhere... I said, I said Stevie Wonder is probably rolling over in his grave and he's not even dead yet oh yeah i would have i would have flipped the table on little freak and then went once omg came out tom was done so here's the thing with this album (laughs) i know that there's and i'm gonna get in trouble so direct your hate teats to et bowser but there is a lot of usher love going on right now and deservedly so deservedly so he deserves flowers i'm not mad at that but there's some revisionist history from some of you players because there was a very long stretch starting here, maybe even a little bit before, depending on how you felt about here at Stan, 
where it was really shaky for Mr. Raymond. And this is where, to me, it started because you could tell he did not know what he wanted to do. He was mm -hmm. trying to serve too many masters. He was like, I'm going to do the EDM thing. I'm going to run to hip hop radio. Oh, I'm going to do a traditional R&B joint. He was just everywhere. And yeah. that meant that pretty much every project this decade was a hot mess because it was no consistency to anything. That was my issue with this out. But on Twitter, if you can believe it, this is ranked pretty high according to the Twitter folks. They love well, this album. Well, as I say, it's yeah. a lot of re if you listen to Twitter, here I stand as a five star <laughs> classic. Raymond versus Raymond was under like uh, okay. if you like it, okay, but yeah. let's not be crazy. But I'll tell you what actually was underrated. Neo's Libra scale. It it didn't have the hits that I think the previous albums did. But when you listen to like the first seven or eight songs of that album, right before yes. you get to like Beautiful Monster, because I don't know what was happening there. <laughs> before you get to that song, the album is actually like smooth R&B and it's like Neo at his finest. It, it just didn't have the hit. Well, that's an album. I was not a big fan of this one. I really, my the same thing I said about Raymond versus Raymond, you can say about this album, in my opinion. But it was a better album than that, sure, for sure. And you're right. Some of the, the good songs are really good. But it was another one where I just felt like all of our veterans and the stalwarts of R&B for the years prior, they got in this decade and didn't know what was going on. So they were just like, I'm going to try this, and I'm going to try this, and I'm going to try this, and I'm going to try this. And the projects just got, the wires got crossed. So it's, I have seen a lot of love for it in recent years. It's definitely better than like, red which i actually will argue with y'all later because i prefer that mm. we'll talk oh, about that we'll talk wow. about it next time we'll talk about it next time but see, yeah it was a struggle for your boy but see here's the thing people forgot about this album i think it's really good right you had beautiful monster which probably was the, the single they pushed you had champagne life which was a single and a really that was, good smooth r&b song you had one in a absolutely. million which wasn't a huge single but it was it was put out then you had Absolutely. a bunch of other good R&B songs like Making a Movie, Telekinesis. These are good songs. Even the song with Fabulous. Only 10 tracks on here. Concise album. I, I liked it a lot. I think it's his most slept on project. Yeah. Telekinesis was dope. It has some joints. I'm not going to hate. And then we got to talk about Trey's album. This is the follow-up to Ready. I feel like they pretty much took that Ready blueprint and tried to do it again. Never really pans out that way, but the album is solid. I, I really don't have any complaints about about it. Although, Tom, I know you really like the song Bottoms Up. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's probably in my top 10 worst favorite songs of all time, I'd oh. say. Tom, sometimes I want to like throw Tom out of the window. Sometimes I want to put him under my arm because he's my twin brother. <laughs> I didn't know Tom in 2010, but we have a shared hatred. For bottoms up, I cannot stand that song. <laughs> Wait, um, bottoms up and say ah are not the same song, right? No, no, those are two, they're just two equally bad songs. But they're basically the same thing. They're about getting drunk yes. by the yeah. same <laughs> drunken guy. And then, um, and then, and then a couple years later, which we'll talk about. Uh, well, it's two reasons that uh, Trey came to the club. It was for the. Bitches uh -huh. in the uh -huh. yes. Oh my God. <laughs> we know, Kyle. We know. Yes. Anyway, that back to the album. Yes. Kyle is right. This was basically Ready Part Two. And whenever you do a part two, it's going to be lesser than. It's like when you do a photocopy of something, the quality is going to be like a little bit less than the original. But I like the album. It's one of his better albums because it follows so closely to that blueprint. And at the time, I still say, and I stand by this with old cousin Chris going through what he was going through. Trey was really positioning himself as like the guy in R&B at the time. So he was really riding a wave until he started saying I'm bottoming up and then mm. uh, kind of lost his way, as we will hear later on in the decade. Yes. I'm uh, sorry. I don't mean to. I don't mean to. Um, can yes. I just go on a random tangent and name another of my top 10 worst favorite songs while we're mm -hmm. talking about these alcohol and do songs oh blame it on the alcohol yes i was like uh, please save. oh my kyle oh man that's a you club banger no and you, no <laughs> that's a these club banger these type of songs were all coming out around the same time and i was just so furious this is why i had to step up and start you know i got soul to block wow. out 
and let people know there was still actually real R&B being made somewhere by some well, people. Uh, every song was either a true tree pain chasing some stripper, <laughs> or it was somebody getting drunk in the club, <laughs> blacked out drunk. That was yes. every song on the radio. <laughs> Please yes. come up with something. New. That was every song. So, Tom, I take it you were not a fan of the T-Pain song, Bartender? <laughs> Absolutely not. Oh, man. You My can goodness. just say, I am not a fan of T-Pain in the sentence, and then you'll be good. <laughs> you, you guys just had to be there. Oh, I was there. Uh, <laughs> I, I, was wish there. I, wa- I wish I wasn't there. <laughs> oh, man. Um. Uh, I'm going to mention these two albums, although um, they're probably not in my top three, which we'll get into, but Tony Braxton's Pulse album and Sierra's Basic Instinct. I know people want us to talk about those two albums because Tony Braxton and Sierra both have huge fan bases, but I wouldn't call them uh, their best albums, but no, shadows to them. I, I like Libra Scale. That has some joints on it. Um, Sierra is going to Sierra every time. That's the album with like the comic book looking cover. No, this is the one after. This is the one with Ride, but with Louis. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, you can see the to- how <laughs> Tony the Tony album is the Pulse album. This is the one where she had that Trey Songs duet. Yeah. Now Pulse I like, and I mean I like Libra Scale. That was dope. But yeah. Sierra uh, and right. just provided evidence that we don't remember anything about yeah, this year. This is... <laughs> no, I can't help you with this one. So this is proof that Ed was listening to those club bangers by T Pain. Oh yeah. boy. Maybe that's why I have no memory because my brain is rotted from the <laughs> auto tune and alcohol. Yes. And and I'll just shout out one uh more album, Dwelle's World Wants Women, because the number one song in our countdown that year was What's Not to Love, his single from that album. What no. a good song. Good song. Produced and written by our guy Mike City. Right. That's where, is, it, where is Dwelle these days? Dwelle has not released an album since 2012, I want to say. It's yeah, been people- uh, People ask me all the time, like, you got to do it, whatever happened to him on Duele. And I'm always like, he just vanished. Like, I don't know what I could do. So shout out well, to he, Duele. I mean, he just, he still tours all the time. He just doesn't put out music, you know? I think he gave up on new music. And I can't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's wrap things up here. You know how it is. Rookie of the year. We've got Janelle Monet, Miguel Dondria. If we want to put Marsh in there, we can. That's an EP. I don't know if we can really put that in there. So we'll just go with those three: Janelle Monae, Miguel, and Dondria. Who is your Rookie of the Year, Ed? Players already know my answer for this one. It's got to be Janelle. Fantastic debut. I mean, you can make a strong argument for Miguel since he would have a stronger R and B base in the coming years. But you want to come to creativity and just the dopest album. It's my girl, Tom. I'm gonna have to agree with Ed can uh, really go against his argument there. I mean, there was really not much to pick from, as we've discussed, but, you know, let's go with Janelle. Oh, man, I'm going with Miguel here because I'm looking at the track list. We have Sure Thing, which is a huge hit, but we also have the J. Cole record, All I Want Is You. That was huge. That was a good one. It was. And then we have Quickie, which a lot of people loved. That's I love that one. Three big singles in 2010. You don't really get that. He had a couple other joints too that I'm blanking on at the moment. But that album had that was a pretty solid album. That was that was. And I found out my Marlene, my wife, doesn't really even listen to R and B that much, especially newer stuff. And somehow she randomly loves this album. (laughs) It's so weird to me. (laughs) Well, same for my wife. She's kind of given up on this stuff a long time ago, but she loves early Miguel. She still plays that. So there you go. Now, let's get into the fun stuff here. Your top three favorite R&B albums of yes. 2010. We've talked about a lot of them. Um, how did we do this? Did we like all take turns or go three, two, one? Or did we just list them in, like individually? I think we did three, two, one. But okay, let's do three, two, one. Matter. Okay. Tom, I'll go with you. What's your number three favorite album of 2010? It's interesting because I'm looking at the top 10 I created back in 2010. And I'm seeing if it still stands up. Believe it or not, it's actually different now. Hmm. Mm. So number, th- I mean, number three, I had R. Kelly back then. R. Kelly, I'm sorry, you you bumped out the top ten. Oh, oh man. man. Didn't age too well, Tom. <laughs> Didn't age well. Oh, man. Wait, do I get an honorable mention? This is top we, three, but yeah, you can get an honorable mention. I think mention we did anymore. honorable mentions. Yeah. I think we just, did. One, uh, just one, just like this one just missed. I'm going to have to say my guy, Raheem, just missed. He's right there. 
mm-hmm. and Faith Good just one. missed. Faith and Raheem just missed. But my number three is Neo Libra Scale. Mm. Good album. Ed? I will do my honorable mention will be my boy Miguel because I really like that album. But number three, I'm going to go with Miss Badu. Badu, give us another album. Stop playing. Really love this album. That's a good album. My number three, well, honorable mention, I'm going to put my girl Dondria in there because that we love Dondria. We'll, we'll give her an honorable mention here. My number three will be... I'll go with Trey, Passion, Pain, and Pleasure. Even though I despise Bottoms Up, that was a that was a solid <laughs> album. So we're gonna go with Trey. Uh, number two, Tom. Uh, I gotta go with with the the Legend Dale DeBarge Second Chance album. Great comeback, mm-hmm. very unexpectedly solid. Even the song with Fifty Cent somehow worked. But and I hated Fifty Cent. So <laughs> I didn't know you were a Fifty hater. I thought you'd be a oh. No, you know, no. you New York guys stick together. So I thought you'd be all about 50. I don't stick with uh, Dipset either. If that's if you're wondering. <laughs> well, there's a reason. I like Cam, but get rid of the rest of them. <laughs> oh, man. Ed, number two. Number two is an album that we didn't even discuss that I'm a huge fan of and think that is very underrated because it just kind of came and went due to circumstances. But I'm going to go with CeeLo's Lady Killer for number two. Mm. I thought this album was so underrated at the time. Everybody gets stuck on the single, the F you, forget you, whatever you want to call it. And that's like, to me, like not even close to the best song on the album. But the other content on the album is just so well written. And as a soul singer, we think of CeeLo so much as, I mean, today we just think of him as a game show host or whatever he does. But when it comes to actual soul vocals, the man can sing. And this album was great. I wish we got more of that. We didn't really get much more like this after this project. Mm. But I thought this was a extremely underrated album and holds up in some respects. So my number two uh, will be Libra Scale by Neo. I think that was a solid album, except Beautiful Monster. But yeah, uh, that's one of those albums that I can still listen to now. And I'm happy with the end result i know neo doesn't really talk about this album anymore either but neo you got to go back and re-listen to this there are some joints on here yes yeah, on it. your number one i feel like yeah i feel like it just for neo like because that album didn't do well it really pushed him to go more popular absolutely so like, which sucks but you're not wrong he went all in on beautiful monster <laughs> number uh, one tom I- I'm sticking with Eric Benet. I'm Ooh. sticking with, uh, I hate to say it, but man, I don't listen to this album as much these days. It does come off a little dated now, so I don't revisit it as much, but to me, it's still high quality. When it came out, it was didn't really sound like anything else that was out, so I appreciate it. Ed? I think it's no secret what my number one is. It is the Arc Android herself, Janelle wow. Monet. That's my number one and probably a top five for the decade. Just so creative, so well done. Perfect introduction into the sound that she would and the creativity she would bring to the decade. Really good stuff. I wish we got some of that on the new album, but that's a conversation <laughs> on another day. This is a great album. My number one by Miles and Miles. So if I were to redo this, my number one would actually be that Dirty Money album. What? That's just me. But since I didn't actually consider that to be an R&B album, we're going to go with Monica's <laughs> Still Standing because, and it's not so much revisiting it now because I do listen to some of the songs now um, and, and some of it is really good, but it's more so taking it back to that time and how much I love that album. So there's a nostalgic factor to it as well. And just, it was better times. It was, it was a happy time. I remember when that <laughs> album came out and just loving those songs because that represents... Yeah. That was like one of those last albums that represented my era of R&B before it changed and got weird. So I'm going to go with Monica. <laughs> and it's going to get weird next year. <laughs> Trust me. Yes, yes. So that kind of wraps up 2010. Um, like I said, the albums get weirder and weirder as we go along. But I think it's important. 
for us to come together and make that commitment that we'll get to at least 20. What are we stop? What's our commitment to the fan base here? Because I, I, I can't do 2019 or 2020. I, I don't even <laughs> we, know what happened. Clay, we got to at least go to 2019. We stopped at the 99. We stopped at 2009. Yikes. We got to do 2019. 2019, 2018. Well, you got booed up. You can talk about booed up in 2018. I think Tom stopped hour. in like 2018. I, I'm Tom, trying to think. Yeah. Tom would sit in the corner for those last two years. because I think He, he might up. need our guy, uh, Shaquille Perry. To join you for those episodes. Shaquille, he's just gonna talk about Aaliyah. We're just gonna argue about the ranking of Missy's albums. Well, Shout then, out to uh, my boy. I haven't talked to Shaquille lately. <laughs> I don't know who you're gonna get that because I don't know anything in those years. I could probably go to 2016. I feel Wait. like whoever's tuned in though wouldn't even you know. You can what do I'm 2016. 2016, you can do. Wait, guys, we forgot an album. Oh, I'm afraid to ask. Which one? <laughs> Our boy Barry Barr's artist, Jeremiah, All About You, second album. There's a reason. Nothing. Eh? I did. There's a reason I... why it was forgotten. <laughs> I... Oh, man. I literally didn't even. Well, well here's, we ch- here's an actual album we forgot to mention by an artist we care about, Sunshine Anderson. Oh, Sun yes. Shines again. Oh, yes. yes. Now, that was a good album. I Yes. Yes, yes. Something so, is that was the one with something I want to give you? That was my song. No, this is uh you ain't got a lot to kick it. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. And she has some joints. I love this album. Yes. Yeah, that one deserves some love. Yes. Um I just saw a comment on here. Y'all should go back to the eighties next. See, Whoa. that's that's tough. We didn't live in those moments. Yeah. Well, I didn't live in those moments, so I can't even really speak on that. <laughs> well, we this came up before during the last one. The reason yeah. why I didn't do it, and I've been, and we'll talk about this later, I've been ranking um hip-hop albums from the decades as well for the yeah. 50th anniversary of hip-hop. I didn't do the 80s because, you know, I was born to, I want to talk about stuff that I lived through, and I don't yeah. want to just, like, go back and talk about stuff that I heard or just looked on the Wikipedia at the charts. Yeah. I was too young. So that's why I don't talk with confidence about the eighties, the late eighties. I can do early eighties. Uh, yeah. But you see E-Man. that comment was like a subtle gesture of like, guys, no one gives a crap about the the, the decade of the yeah. 2010s. Let's just, take, let's let's just bring it all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> let's go to I'm, the sixties. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, on a side note here, before we get out of here, I came across an article recently that said it was like five scientific reasons why Jodeci's Diary of a Mad Band is the greatest R&B album of all time. I didn't I actually saw click on the link, but that, that seems like clickbait here. It, oh, yeah. I read it, and I'm not, you know, I'm not knocking the person that wrote it. It was actually a very well-written story. I didn't agree because if you look at it, and I can't remember all six of the reasons, but one of the reasons was... The second half of the album isn't as good as the first, but it's still, I don't like play. You just destroyed your whole argument. That's why it's not one of the best because the second half isn't as good as the first. It's okay. If it was a list of six reasons why this is my favorite album. Okay, cool. Keith Sweat's 1996 album is one of my favorite albums. It's not the best album of all time. So y'all just got to tip of your expectations here, player. Not to hate (laughs) on the writer because it was well-written. But no, it is nowhere near the best album of the era. And lastly, before we get out of here, because I see this trending on Instagram right now, Tank posted it. No oh boy. I'm going to put you guys on the spot here. It doesn't have to be long. This can be a quick discussion here. Which R&B artist or group has the best R&B interludes? Oh, that's... <laughs> At first, I was gonna say that's easy, but then I uh, thought of like five. So one one twelve comes to mind for me. One twelve was the first thing that jumped to yeah. mind. Yeah, one twelve is great. Faith is great. Yeah. Um. Man, I, I mean, I'll Those be honest. Probably... I, don't, I don't. I don't really even like interludes unless they're like a song. You know, <laughs> well, like yeah. But then if it's like good, then it's like I'm mad because I wanted the full song. Of yes, they're a tease. But <laughs> in 2023, real songs are the length of interlude. So yeah. like you can't even tell them apart. Yeah. But like how yeah. remember remember that genuine interlude with that song in the background? I want that song and we can never find it. Oh, yeah. It's on the, uh, it. 
think none of your friends business on the uh oh i know what you're talking about yeah, yeah. there's some yeah. great song in the background he's singing and we never even got to hear it yeah. I'm, I'm mad i my all i always get happy when they turn the interlude into a full song kelly yeah. price did it 112 did it with for a while like i when that turn when that happens i get so excited but then there's also times when like they turn the interlude into a full song and it just it doesn't live up to the hype well, that's because the expectations were too high. We that's were like, expecting five stars and we got three. Yeah, it's like when Trey Songs did uh so Panty Dropper was the intro for Ready, and then he actually mm-hmm. put it out as a full version. But part of it is because when they're doing the 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 interlude, it's not finished and they just put it out there and then they right. go back and try to recreate it. It never works out that way. You gotta yeah, do it you, in the moment. You gotta have it in the moment. You lose the spirit of it. That's yeah. true. So well, on the topic, and this is a timely one to mention, yeah. I randomly was out in the streets in New York City. A guy was on a bike with a boombox strapped to the back of his bike, blasting this interlude, Miguel's girl with a tattoo. Mm. It was like one of the most peaceful things I've ever seen in my life. What a random interlude to blast <laughs> just like riding down the street. I, I know. I'm it with was... it, though. I'm with it. <laughs> yes. So. Uh, shout out to R&B interludes. We more, we need more of them. We need musicality. We need a lot. But one we day we'll get, there, we'll get there. We'll get there. Well, yeah, it's. I'm about to do my best albums of the half year, and it's got to be three albums long. I need. We got two weeks. I need y'all to step this game up. <laughs> I can't get twenty five albums. albums. I feel like all yes. the R&B veterans have given up. No, their albums. Like I get like four or five links to albums every week. Are they good? That's another question. Mm. Well, Tyrese's new album is coming out soon, so R and B is back. <laughs> you know, you know, a Tyrese uh, album is coming when he's all over social media. Yes, yeah, so when he comes out of his woodwork to start talking and ranting, it's an album coming. Yes. we shall see. Ugh. All right, I think that's it for uh, for this week. We'll be back. Let's try to do this more often. We got to get through 2011, 2012, and I don't know where we're going to end off. I feel like by by the time the TGT album comes, I think that's our cutoff point. No, we can do 2015. We've got um, the Tamiya album. We've got the um, Jasmine album. 2015 was good. Okay. After that, it gets re- <laughs> <laughs> You've yeah. been warned. All right. Well, well, we'll, we'll wait on that for next week, guys. Appreciate you guys for tuning in uh this has been fun and we'll do it all over again soon i said next week but it by next week it'd be it could be six months from now so yeah i'll see y'all in guys. six months see you in <laughs> halloween <laughs>